it at first. And I'm like, oh. The following podcast was produced by Big Head Amusements for KQEK.com. For the cryptic sci-fi thriller The Signal, available on CD from Vera Sarabond Records, Iranian-born composer Nima Fakrara crafted an electronic score that reflects the inventiveness of Iran's new generation of composers and musicians and Fakrara's own sensibilities, creating custom instruments and sounds from unlikely sources and integrating them into seamless works tailored for unique filmic projects. In our interview, Fakrara discusses his entry into film music and how the signal reflects both his own musical heritage and a keen interest in minimalism, a music style shared with mentor Hans Zimmer. My background is Persian classical music. I, w- I was born in Iran, uh, moved to the U.S. in '96. Uh, I've played music since I was a little kid, since I was five years old. Um, I wanted to be a concert musician for a while, and what I wanted to do is I just wanted to play basically my hammer dulcimer all around the world, and I realized that that wasn't going to make me any money. <laughs> so once I moved to the West Coast and to California. I started understanding film music and started playing around with some of the, some of my Middle Eastern instruments on different scores, and I realized that I could actually do that. And went to school, Cal State Northridge, and did a couple of short films, and that's that's pretty much it. Started working for a couple of composers, and then here we are now. And I wonder if you could describe a little bit uh, the Hammer Dulcimer. Sure. It's a relative of the, the Celtic dulcimer, the Irish dulcimer. It's, it's called the Santur, actually. It has, yeah, it has 18 bridges with nine, uh, I guess, nine bridges on each side. You could play three octaves on it, unlike the Irish instrument that you could have you could have four or five different octaves on it that you could actually just play. Uh, It has a lot of limitations, but us young musicians of Iran have actually tried to figure out how those limitations can be conquered, if you will. With your background, because you mentioned that uh, you also specialize in a number of Middle Eastern instruments, have you found that that's been a major asset to you, especially in working on a lot of scores where you've got a lot of really inventive composers who want uh, sort of unusual sounds? One of my favorite things to that, that I have studied as well is music anthropology. So I've I've understood a lot of different worldly instruments, if you will, and kind of understanding how instruments are made. I, I do make a lot of instruments myself. I do create instruments pretty much per project basis. And I think that because of that, because of my background of Middle Eastern music and the limitations that Middle Eastern music, especially Persian music, has. I've tried to take those limitations by heart and actually make them make them work to my advantage, such as, um, I mean, I've taken instruments and I've modified them many times to get a better sound or to get some bass sounds that doesn't exist. I mean, bass instruments don't exist in Iranian or Persian classical music. So I've tried to add strings to instruments um, and such uh, like that. But... I do use my instruments, Middle Eastern, doesn't matter doesn't matter if it's Middle Eastern, African instruments, Indian instruments, Afghani instruments, to create different colors and create interesting textures within an instrument and within a score. Um, that's mostly it. Unless I'm doing a Middle Eastern score, they're not prominently noticeable. They're more of the colors and they're more of kind of textures. We mentioned that in Iranian classical music that they're isn't a heavy prominence of uh, bass instruments, or I guess instruments that have heavy bass sounds. Do you have any um, explanation for the reason why the music is sort of drifted (laughs) towards different sounds? Because you find that in a lot of cultures, there's always like heavy drum sounds, or they've they've found some way to create something that's very, very low and resonant. I mean, um, I I think going back, going back history-wise, and uh, going back to kind of the musical history of Iranian Persian classical music, it's a very intimate setting, if you will. So with that said, I mean, it used uh, basically still sometimes it's it's two instruments playing with a singer and and it's usually just one melodic instrument, one percussive instrument, and that's it. So it didn't allow for something to be just there, kind of like an upright bass or even an electric bass to actually create a bass tonality. I mean, 
a lot of Persian classical music, it's very drone based as well. I mean, you could take one drone and you could play it for 15 minutes and it will still sound great. So it necessarily that does not need to create a structural bass tonalities. Uh, I mean, you hear it in rock and roll, you hear it in a lot of different genres of music that a bass is what runs everything. In Persian classical music, it doesn't require it. I mean, just recently we've uh, the musicians in Iran and the instrument makers have created instruments that could do that. The oud is one instrument that we've kind of adopted into our into our culture that is an Iraqi Arab instrument that covers that whole bass frequency. And also we've taken different instruments such as such as the cello now that we could actually kind of take into consideration and actually play with the cello in the Persian setting. It's it's difficult to it's difficult to say because there's not that many players that do play the cello in Iran. Uh, they, they play it in a very much of a Western classical setting. So for them to play those quarter notes, it's very difficult until they actually understand um, the distance between the fingering. So some of these musicians that have played, for example, the kamanche, which is the spike fiddle, that is very similar to the violin, they've taken the violin and actually adopted it into the kamanche. They could play Western stuff on the kamanche, but still have that tonality of the quarter tones. So these kamanche of players have started coming kind of going to the bigger instruments such as the bass and cello and that now they could actually create those bass tonalities for the Persian classical music. Well, it, it, it sounds like a, it's, it's a very inventive culture because when film scores tend to be done now, there's obviously sound libraries that people can draw from and there's certain effects that you can create digitally. But I guess coming from a background where you create things essentially from hand and you physically modify instruments, I think that's kind of unusual. And I think that's, that's a really unique asset to have because what you end up being able to do is create any kind of unique organic sound catered towards a very specific film or a specific uh, non-film project. Uh, no, of course. I mean, it's it's an interesting. It's it's. Here's the thing about Persian classical music. I mean, I grew up playing pretty much all the repertoire repertoires and understanding them. Unfortunately, and fortunately, with those, you create limitations for people, uh, for the musicians especially. So what happens is that these musicians that are kind of such as like myself. Um, I mean, I started playing music since I was five years old, and I was a rebel in that sense of wanting to just step away. I mean, as a kid. Um, you have that tendency of just kind of exploring everything. So for me, when sitting with these masters of Persian classical music, such as my teachers, um, you sit there and you try to change everything and these masters just hold you back. So at one point, you just basically burst and you just kind of start messing around with things. You get away from that repertoire. You play things differently. You think about you think about how I could create different sounds. So this revolution has happened just recently as well. I mean, there are masters in Iran that have recognized this and have started modifying instruments as well, which is very interesting and very, very beautiful in that sense. But then again, it's it's just instrument making. I mean, we're... Um, you could say that these instruments... The, the traditional Persian classical instruments were created back, I don't know, back when... <laughs> uh, back during the day, and they had never been modified. So now it's the time that's being modified and just being revolutionized. Well, that sense of experimentalism, I guess that's what made you very... Uh very ideal for scoring uh, the signal uh, without giving away too much story um, I mean it's about it's about three kids that are going through a journey but what will and I kind of try to do was to create a environment for these kids um, for these characters to be immersed in and not know what's going on it's it's very difficult for a score to not give away hints of the of what's going to happen so that was the biggest part of it and we wanted to create something that is interesting we wanted to create something that hasn't been done before so that's why we created instruments that's why we we just basically recorded an orchestra and turned it up on his head and see what kind of what we could do with it and and yes because of the time constraint as well it it made our creativity a lot better <laughs>
for the score itself, did you use a traditional chime instrument? or Because I know in, in the booklet, I think there's a bit of a photograph of some of the instruments that were used on the score. We've used, uh, I mean, the, the instruments that, that you see in those pictures, uh, they were all handmade original instruments that I created uh, from different things from the world, if you were. I mean, we went to a uh, we went to a junkyard and just started messing around with different things and see what made noise. Um, the pagoda that you, uh, I, I think that you, that you've seen the tree-like instrument, um, it's actually an electric conduit. And what it does, it's, it's all those notes, uh, I guess, you could hear it on the second track of the score. It's the whole um, melodic instrument that you hear. And uh, the interesting part about all of these instruments is that they're obviously not tuned to traditional instruments. So what we had to do is we either had to tune those instruments electronically or make our traditional instruments tuned to those instruments. I mean, for example, like the steel marimba that is made out of stainless steel tubes that has, uh, I think, 12 notes on it, but it covers maybe uh, maybe four half steps. So it's all those notes between notes that plays through those things. But it allowed us to actually kind of create this new vocabulary for the score, uh, which was very refreshing for me, especially coming from this kind of experimental phase. And then the uh, the electronic design of the score, was that something that was discussed at the beginning with you? And um, how did that concept kind of shape itself? Because it's a score that isn't, uh, it doesn't evoke directly some of the classic electronic bands and composers of the last 20 or 30 years. I mean, there, there are little aspects that kind of hint at it, but it's a very refreshing voice. And I think that's one of the reasons why I enjoyed the score so much. Thank you so much. Uh, actually, the first thought process, I mean, when I w met with Will, uh, one of our biggest challenges and biggest things that we talked about was what are these characters doing? Is this a road story? Is this a road trip story? Is this a thriller? Is this a mystery? Is this a sci-fi? So what we wanted to do was to kind of create, um, create stuff that is actually kind of clearly tells a story. I mean, I tried with the soundtrack as well to kind of convey a story story structure with the beginning of just a very kind of ominous, feel-good sound all the way to the end um, to kind of tell a full story as well. And the electronic element came into a, came into play is because we we are dealing with a sci-fi um, sci-fi story and also unfortunately, unfortunately, you can't tell too many um, too many things with, I guess, I don't want to say traditional, but acoustic instruments. Um, even the acoustic instruments were kind of electronic, electronified uh, with going through synthesizers and, um, and seeing what we could kind of do going through delays. But the electronic elements were just kind of those things that we just, uh, I mean, I love, I love analog synths and things like that. So it was things that were laying around in the studio and just kind of messed around with and kind of things came out of him <laughs> and they were just like let's record them and just well we, that's what happened with it the score has a really wonderful warm sound to it definitely analog and it's i think one of the, the things that makes it very endearing as well because to get that kind of analog warm sound is is it's got to be a bit difficult um, especially if you're trying to transfer it as well into the digital domain sure one of my biggest thing is that um uh, I'm very simple in the sense of what I have in my studio. Um, I don't have too much outboard gear. I'm a very simple kind of a guy. I just use one Mac Pro and that's about it. And I think that's that kind of plays into that as well. Everything just goes directly into my computer. So, and then it's kind of manipulatized. Um, so, so it becomes a very cohesive sound. Even if it, if I'm using a plugin within the computer, it's first into the computer without it going through many, many different channels. Um, so, I mean, sometimes I've heard in uh, in different scores that the electronic elements stand so they stand out in the score and they're not so well married to every all the other elements and i kind of hate that and one of one of my biggest things is that just whenever i do everything it has to be cohesive and they have to be speaking together i mean i was talking to a friend of mine and um we were just talking about just just general scores and he listened to the score and one of the things that he was saying is that with the score there's so many complexity of the signal but yet you could take away all the elements and you could still kind of uh, dissect them and you could still play them together there's there's one time that um, Hans likes to say to about his own score is that 
I'm a minimalist with a maximalist production value. I guess that's what he calls it. Uh, but uh, I mean, I, I kind of do the same exact thing. I'm, 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 I am a minimalist, but still, I have a lot of complex elements that goes through it. There's too many things that happening for your for the general ear to listen to it. I mean, you have to listen back to it to just dissect them and just listen to things separately. I think that's become one of Hans Zimmer's strongest uh, qualities in that if there wasn't um, an overt expression of his interest in minimalism in his earlier scores where there was always a big orchestral sound with a lot of heavy synths, I think uh, maybe in the last 15 years he's kind of embraced it and uh, there's been a lot of scores where he just likes to sort of sit on chords and, and sort of keep repeating stuff and it's just wonderful the way that he keeps exploring more facets of very simple designs and it's it's just wonderful i think that's that's part of filmmaking as well it, the the film the film world has changed and it allows for that not that many people are making star wars anymore and not that many people are making making a movie such as schindler's list so it allows us to do a lot it allows us to just kind of sit there and vamp for a while and let the movie do its talking um i mean one of my favorite uh Basically, what what I listen to, even when I don't listen to scores, I usually don't listen to scores. But uh, what I what I listen to is Philip Glass and Max Richter and all those minimalist composers. And for me, it's just there's this angst and there's this just kind of driving feel to it that you could just tune out the music and you're just listening to your own mind. It works really well. I mean, you listen to any of Philip Glass's stuff and you're just like, how is he just creating this angst without? With, with just not even more than five, six notes. And it's just because it's just this re repetitive aspect of his music. Um, and it's created this beautiful, beautiful, um, beautiful culture and beautiful textural things for a movie. And it allows us to do that. I mean, you could look at a lot of different movies that just recently has been coming out. And you could see those, uh, unless you're li watching the Marvel films. But, um, but you could see those kind of if the music is just very much over the top, it's not going to work. Um, and you could, I mean, sometimes it happens. Um, but then again, you look at Gravity. What Steve, uh, what Steve did is, is amazing. Also, you could listen to, um, I mean, I just recently listened to Two Faces of January by Alberto Iglesias. And that score is just such an interesting combination of just minimalism and also just very beautiful textualized orchestral elements and orchestration. Now you could see that you could do too many many different things for a movie, but I don't think you could do those John Williams s scores anymore unless those movies are going to be made again. Are there any particular types of films that uh, you're really keen on scoring? Because you've got such a diverse background, I wonder if maybe something either even more minimalism or maybe uh, you know a classic action film or perhaps something that is very multi thematic. I've, I've always loved thrillers and I've always loved dramas. I mean, one of my biggest dreams is to do a Middle East. Middle Eastern score, but in the vein of like Argo or Rosewater that John Stewart is doing. Um, I mean, I have so many ideas of kind of creating a non Middle Eastern score with Middle Eastern instruments because uh, I've done it many, many times. Um, I mean, I love doing different things. I love wearing multiple hats and I love jumping from genres to genres because it just allows me to be creative um, and doing things that um, I could kind of get my mind around and just see what I could come up with. The soundtrack for The Signal is available from Varez Saraban Records. Visit Nima Fakrara's website for further composer updates and music samples. For information on the making of the visuals featured in this podcast, please visit BigHeadAmusements.com. further interviews and additional information, please visit kqek.com. For podcasting services, including editing and mixing, please visit the Multimedia Skills section at mondomark.com for further information plus media samples. This program is copyrighted 2014 by Mark R. Hassan.